Hey guys, what's going on? In this tutorial, we'll be writing a faucet smart contract for an ERC20 token. Faucets are programs that give out a specified amount of tokens to anyone who requests them, usually rate limited by a certain time interval. There are a couple of reasons you might want a faucet contract to distribute your tokens, for example, as a promotion, to increase ownership of your token, or simply to provide tokens to developers for testing purposes. Even if you don't have your own ERC20 token or don't th think you need a faucet application, this is a great contract to practice and study because it contains a lot of elements and patterns that are widely used in many different kinds of smart contracts. Some of the things this video will cover include interfaces, events, withdrawals, rate limiting, or working with time intervals for detecting elapsed time, and of course, working with sending and receiving tokens. So in this video, we'll focus on the Solidity smart contract for the faucet, and then we'll build the faucet UI using Web3 in a future video. So if that sounds interesting, stick around and don't touch that dial. All right guys, so let's go ahead and jump into Visual Studio Code or the IDE of your choice. Now this video is sort of an informal continuation of my last video on creating an ERC20 token. So now we're creating a faucet to distribute those tokens. So I'm going to go ahead and continue using that existing project. Now I'm not going to really go over the entire process of how to set up a project from scratch using Hardhat since I covered that in that last video. But if you guys want to review that, please feel free to check out that video for the step-by-step -step process. Link in the video description below. So I have made one minor change since the last video. And if you recall, we were targeting the Rinkaby test network for our ERC20 token. Uh, well, with this project, I'm now targeting Gorly. And big shout out to channel subscriber Stefano for bringing this to my attention that Rinkaby and Ropsten both are going to be retired in the future due to changes relating to the merge, which incidentally is taking place today. So in order to make that change, it's very simple. Um, there are just a couple of touch points. The first one is that I've created a new environment variable in my .env file, and I'm showing you the, the .env.example just so I don't expose my secrets there. And then we have to make a reference to that in hardhat config. If you remember, there was a networks config object, and I've just added a new network right here for Go Early. And I'm referencing that new .env file right here for endpoint. So. Also, don't forget to log into Infura and grab your Go Early endpoint and copy and, and paste it right into your .env file. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get to work on our faucet contract. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go into my contracts folder and create a new file. And I'll call that faucet.sol. And let's go ahead and pop open that file. And I'm just gonna go ahead and paste in my license identifier comment and my pragma solidity statement. After that, We'll create a contract definition, so I'll say contract, faucet, and give it some curly braces. Go ahead and save that. Next, let's go ahead and create a state variable for the contract owner. So this is going to be a variable of type address. Uh, we're going to make it payable because we want the owner to be able to withdraw his or her tokens at any time from the contract. And we'll call it owner. Okay, so let's take a second to just think through how this contract is actually gonna work. So we're creating the faucet as a separate contract and we're gonna preload it with our ERC20 token. So there'll be a limited amount of token that the faucet has control over that can then distribute to whoever requests tokens. I've seen another approach where the faucet code is actually integrated within the ERC20 smart contract itself. And there's no reason you can't do that, however, I don't really like the idea. I, I don't recommend it because then you're, in essence, you're minting new tokens every time someone requests some. So you may create your ERC20 token. You may initially send a certain percentage back to the owner wallet and leave the remaining percentage in the contract to be distributed in various ways. With that approach though, I think it's too tightly coupled. And if there were ever to be a bug or anything wrong with the code, somebody could potentially drain all of those funds, right? So the great thing about having the faucet contract separate is that you can preload it with smaller amounts of tokens, which I think is an overall safer approach. So we're gonna be dealing with an ERC20 token within our smart contract. We're gonna to have to figure out how to do that because we wanna call various methods on our ERC20 token, such as transfer and balance of, for example. 
So in order to work with another contract or call methods on another contract from this contract, we need to use something called an interface. All right, so let's look at the syntax of how to declare an interface. I'm gonna go right above my contract and I'm gonna use the interface keyword and then simply give it a name. And I'm gonna say EIERC20 for interface of ERC20, okay? So basically this, this interface is like a blueprint um, sort of mapping out all of the functions and methods that are available on an ERC20 contract so that our compiler knows what methods are out there, what are available for our code to call, okay? So interfaces allow one cr contract to talk to another contract on the blockchain. Okay, there are a couple of things to remember about interfaces. So we, we only define the functions that we actually need to use. So we don't have to cover all of the functions of a ERC20, for example, in this case. An interface cannot have any function implementation, only the function signature, okay? So for example, let's define our first function. I'm gonna say function transfer, we'll definitely need that. We transfer an ERC20 tokens around. All right, and so the transfer function on our ERC20 takes two parameters, address of type, or address two, and uh, uint256 amount, okay? All right, now we'll say external. So one thing to remember is all function definitions in an interface have to be external because they're gonna be called from another contract, right? View, and then we'll add the return type, returns, this returns a Boolean value. And of course, if you can't remember exactly what the function signature looks like, you can go out to Open Zeppelin, for example, and take a look at the uh, documentation for ERC20. And then that's it. So you'll notice there's no function body. So interfaces, they don't have any implementation, they don't have any body. And so an interface kind of looks like a contract skeleton or blueprint. All right, let's go ahead and I think we only need one more function. So we'll say function balance of. We need to be able to check account balances of our ERC20. And so this takes one parameter, address, account, external because all interface functions are external, view returns also uint256, or not also, but <laughs> uint256, all right. Go ahead and save that. Let's take a look at how we can use our interface. So the basic idea is we're going to call our interface passing in the address of the contract that we want to represent. That will in essence create a local instance of that contract which we can then call methods on in our code. So the first thing I'm gonna do is declare a state variable of type IERC20. And we'll say public token. Next, we'll define our constructor. And this is gonna take one parameter of type address. And we'll call this token. Just like to be pretty explicit with my variable names. And we'll make this of type payable just in case we wanna send in any tokens with the contract deployment. All right, so now we'll We'll create an instance of the ERC20 contract using the interface and assign it to token. So I'll say I ERC20, we'll pass in the token address. So at this point, token will essentially contain an instance of our ERC20 contract that we can then call methods on throughout the rest of our code. Now, while we're here in the constructor, we'll go ahead and set the owner. This is the contract owner. This is gonna be cast to payable, and we'll say message.sender. Okay, and go ahead and save. Okay, so next let's go ahead and write the main function that users will call in order to request tokens. So I'm gonna say function request tokens. This will be a public function. And the main functionality is gonna be uh, calling a method from our token instance, token.transfer. And this takes two parameters, message.sender, the to address, and then the withdrawal amount. Okay, so we haven't yet defined this variable. We'll do that right now. So I'm going to go back up to our state variables. And let's create a new variable for our withdrawal amount. Okay. You went 256. Uh, this can be public, and we'll say withdrawal amount. 
let's set the initial value to 50 tokens, all right? And now we can use, since our token has 18 decimal places, we're gonna say 50 times 10 to the power of 18, all right, to represent those 18 decimal places. Okay, great. So um, we're not done yet. Obviously, we're gonna wanna put a couple of checks in place because we don't want um, invalid accounts to be able to call this function. We don't want someone to be able to repeatedly call this function and essentially drain the faucet account. So what we can do is we can leverage a global variable called block.timestamp to give us an approximate value of the current, the time of the current block. Okay, and then we can add a certain time interval to that to create a future uh, sort of soonest access time that we can then check in this function to see if the user is eligible to withdraw tokens from the contract. Okay, so first I'm gonna add a check to make sure that the request is originating from a valid account. Okay, so we check message.sender is not equal to address of zero, a zero address basically, an invalid address. Okay, so we have to pass this, this check first. The next check is gonna ensure that the smart contract has a sufficient balance to handle the request. All right, so we'll say token.balance of address this. Now address this, again, that refers to the balance of this contract, this smart contract. So we make sure that that is greater than or equal to the requested withdrawal amount, which is 50 tokens, okay? And if it's not, we say insufficient balance and faucet for withdrawal request. And so the final require statement is going to ensure that enough time has elapsed since, since the last request in order to request another withdrawal of tokens. So we said that we can use block.timestamp to get the current time and then add some sort of time interval to that. Now we need to record that along with the user's address. And so to do that, we're gonna use a mapping. So I'm gonna go right above my constructor here and I'm gonna say mapping. Now we've gotta enter the types of mappings that we want. So I'll say address, it's gonna be a mapping of address to uint 256s okay? So we'll have the address of the person calling the contract or the wallet calling the contract and the time interval. And we'll call this next access time, just like that, okay? So next we need to actually declare a variable to hold the time interval that we wanna set. So how long do we want to make our users wait before they can withdraw tokens again? or before they can request tokens again. I think for the purpose of this tutorial, we're gonna set it fairly small to one minute just for testing purposes. But of course you can use any value you want here. So I'm gonna create a new uint256. I'm gonna call this lock time, okay? And I'm gonna say one minute. So I can take advantage of the minutes global variable here to make this easy to write out, one minute. <laughs> Yeah, they don't change it for singular, so one minutes, two minutes, three minutes. So set this to whatever you like. I suggest a lower value for testing just until we make sure everything's working correctly. So I can come down and compose my require statement now. Okay, so we're gonna say require block.timestamp must be greater than or equal to next access time of the current address. So message.sender, okay. All right, now let's write our error message. Whoops, that jumped down there for some reason. Okay, let's say insufficient time elapsed since last withdrawal. Try again later. So yeah, you can make the message be whatever you like, of course. And I'll just fix the spelling here, there we go. All right, so the final thing we need to do is actually set the new time whenever they request a token. So right before the transfer, I'm gonna space this out just a little bit more and I'll say next access time of message.sender, okay, will be equal to block.timestamp plus lock time. Great, okay, go ahead and save that. 
Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is to create a receive function so that we can actually preload our faucet with tokens. Because remember with this model, we're not actually minting directly from the ERC20, we're preloading the faucet with tokens so that users can then request them. So to do that, to send funds to any smart contract, we need a receive function. All right, so I'm gonna go right down here and say receive, should be external and payable in order to receive funds, okay. Now, inside this receive function, what we can do is we can broadcast an event. So if you're familiar with event-driven architecture, the way it works, it's really pretty simple. Basically, part of the code broadcasts an event in response to some action that's taken, and it can send a, a payload of data that describes that action. And then other parts of the code can listen to those events and react accordingly, whether that be call a, an event handler or, or something else or do some logging. So we can broadcast an event when, whenever the smart contract receives funds. So the way we can do that, I'm gonna go back up to the top of the code here, and let's see, I'm gonna define an event. I'll go underneath the lock time, the one that we just set up in the last, last section. So I'll say event to define a new event. I'm gonna say deposit, name of the event, and then the data that we want to be able to send. So I'm gonna create two parameters here, I'm gonna say the address of the externally owned account that made the deposit and then the amount. So this will be a uint 256 and we'll say amount. All right, so we've defined an event right here with that line. And now in order to actually send or broadcast the event, we can use the emit keyword. All right, deposit. And then we can send in message.sender That'll give us the address of whoever made the deposit. And we'll say message.value. All right, great. All right, so what other kind of functions might be useful for our faucet contract? Um, I usually like to implement a basic function to just return the balance of the contract, mostly for testing, just to see how many tokens the contract currently holds. All right, so I'll say new function, function get balance. No parameters, that's gonna be external because we wanna be able to call it from, you know, Remix or, or another um, D app or something like that. So this is gonna return a uint256. Yeah. And we'll call the token instance. So we'll say token dot balance of and then we'll say address this to give us the smart contract address. All right, great, that's all we need to do there. Go ahead and save that. Now we might want a couple of setters. We might wanna set some of these parameters that we've sort of hard coded up here, like the withdrawal amount and what else, the, um, the lock time. So let's set up some setter functions for those two just to give us some flexibility if we change our mind later. All right, so we'll start with withdrawal amount, function set withdrawal amount. Okay, so we want it to take in the new amount, you went 256 amount. All right, now we, we probably want to gate this or limit this to only a lot of these setters so that only the owner of the contract can call them. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say only owner, even though we haven't set up this access modifier yet, we'll do that in just a minute. This is a pretty standard pattern, only owner. All right, so we'll set the new withdrawal amount to our variable that we've set up previously. So this is gonna be the amount and we want to be able to pass in the amount in sort of human readable numbers, not worry about the 18 decimal places. So what we can do is take care of that here. Oops. So I'm gonna use this pattern, pattern again where we say times 10 to the 18th, all right, to give us our 18 decimal places. All right, great, and uh, no need to return it because this is setting a variable, so we are good there. Um, let's go ahead and set up that axis modifier before I, before I forget. So I'll just go down and I like to have this at the bottom usually, but it doesn't matter. So I'll say modifier only owner. 
And then we'll put our require statement in here. And, oops. All right, so message.sender must equal owner, or else we display this message. Only the contract owner can call this function. Great. All right, and don't forget this special bit of syntax, just an underscore to sort of designate the rest of the, the function body that this is being applied to. All right, so now we're good with our only owner. Next, we'll write our set lock time function, okay, so that we can modify the lock time as we need to. So I'll say set lock time, and this will take a uint256, we'll say amount, so we'll, we'll send in the amount in minutes, and then apply that, and again I'll make this a only owner function. Alright, so inside the function body, we're going to be setting to the lock time variable, right? and so we'll say amount times one minutes and that'll give us the total amount of minutes for the interval that the user needs to wait before requesting new funds. Go ahead and save that. Okay, and finally we need to set up a withdrawal function so that the owner of the contract can withdraw all their funds at any time for any reason they want to. So I'm gonna say function withdraw. External and only owner, very important. All right, so inside this function, we'll say token dot transfer message just sender, and we'll say the full balance. Okay, so token balance of address of this contract. All right, all right, I think that looks good. Go ahead and save. All right, so we have one event that we're using for the deposit, but uh, I think there are a couple of more we can actually add. And ERC20 actually has an event for transferring, so we can um, define that back up here in the interface. Event transfer, and then here's what the signature looks like. A couple of parameters here, address. Indexed from, oops. <laughs> address indexed to and you went 256 value. Now the index keywords that you might see in some events, what that means basically is that you can search by these parameter names in event logs after these events are fired. So that's just something that helps you uh, basically search the logs. Um, by the way, I can add that here as well. And you can have up to three indexed parameters per event, I believe. There we go. All right, and let's create one more event for withdraw. So I'll say with draw, and this is going to be an address two and an amount. By the way, you don't have to have these events. This is just kind of extra here. Yeah, we can also say indexed. Yeah, so totally optional. Uh, if you don't feel like messing with this, then uh, you can, you know, this will obviously function just fine without the events. Okay, just sort of the icing on the cake. All right, so now we can actually go ahead and use that withdrawal event down in the withdrawal function. So emit withdraw. And this is gonna take a address two and an amount, right? So basically the same as the, the signature for the actual transfer. So I'll just copy and paste that. All right, so before we go any further here, I've just got to fix one thing real quick. We've got some syntax highlighting here, alerting me to the fact that we're not returning a uint256 as our function signature says we should be. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add the return statement here. I forgot to add that earlier. So just uh, make sure you have that return statement in the get balance function. All right, so next we're gonna take a look at writing a deploy script for our faucet contract. 
Oh, and by the way, one more thing about the interface. So we wrote the interface out manually by hand just because I wanted to show you guys the process. However, um, there is an interface that we can utilize from Open Zeppelin since we've already installed the Open Zeppelin contracts. So we could just, where is it? Um, go down under Open Zeppelin contracts token. Um, where is it? Common? No. Oh, it's under ERC20. And then right down here, you see there's an IERC20. All right, and so this is an interface, so you could just import this. Um, it's got every single function. So, you know, we didn't need every single one, so maybe we actually did the right thing here by just, you know, having the minimal amount of code. But we could just use an import statement and bring in this interface directly instead of writing it out manually. So just wanted to give you that option, um, just in case you want to do it that way as well. All right, so let's go ahead and write a deploy script for the faucet contract. So I'm gonna go under the scripts folder and create a new file. And I'm gonna say deploy faucet, just to differentiate it from our um, token script, .js. Okay, and what I'm gonna do just to save a bit of time, I'm gonna actually open up our, our first deploy script and copy and paste the code and just change what we need because it's pretty much the same. All right, so we'll just change, you know, ocean token to faucet, and just remember to maintain the capitalization. So the first two, it's uppercase, and then where we're actually referencing the instance, it's lowercase. Okay, and a couple more instances right here, and right here. And I'll change this to say faucet contract deployed, faucet address. All right, so um, the one thing that needs to change, oh, I forgot right here as well. It's uppercase faucet. All right, so remember our constructor parameter for the faucet is going to be uh, the token address, right? So what we need to do is first we need to deploy our token, our ERC20 token, right? And then we need to record the address and we need to copy and paste it in here and then go ahead and deploy our faucet. So that's exactly what we're gonna do next. All right, so first I'm gonna open up a terminal window and we're gonna go ahead and deploy our token. And if you guys don't have the token code, uh, again, that can be downloaded from this, the project repository link in the description of this video. You guys can download that code and follow along with these deployments right here. All right, so I'm gonna make sure I'm in the top level folder, which in this case, it's ocean token. Okay. All right, now I simply need to issue a hard hat command to go ahead and deploy our token. So that's going to be npx hard hat run. We'll specify a network with a network flag. Or we're going to say gorly. Okay. And then scripts dash deploy. So the deploy.js is for the token. Deploy faucet, obviously, for the faucet. Let's go ahead and run that. Okay, and it looks like our token contract has deployed successfully. So what I like to do is just sort of grab this address and save it in a notepad for safekeeping. And then we can go back to our faucet deploy script and we'll go ahead and add that address in, in between two quotes as a string. And now we are ready to go ahead and deploy our faucet contract. Okay, let's deploy the faucet script now. So I'll say npx hardhat run dash dash network g-o-e-r-l-i scripts deploy faucet dot js and let's go ahead and run that all right so our faucet contract has successfully deployed and so i'm just going to quickly grab this address and paste it into my notepad for safekeeping and reference all right so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna use the online remix IDE to connect to our uh, contract on the test net and just do some testing using our MetaMask wallet. All right, so one thing we could do before we even do any manual testing is to go out to the Gorly block explorer and just make sure that we can find our contract here. So this is the address for the faucet contract. And let's just see what it comes up with. Hopefully we'll find something. Yep, that looks about right, about nine minutes ago. Um, from my wallet address, value zero ether, small transaction fee, so that looks good. 
Yeah, I don't think we'll be able to see anything here. Yeah. All right, great. So that's, yeah, that's good enough. That tells me that our contract is in fact deployed to the blockchain. So next let's go over to remix.ethereum.org and this is the Remix IDE, uh, which you've seen in many of my videos. So I'm not gonna go through too much setup here or anything, but basically we'll open up the contracts folder and we'll, we'll utilize one of these existing contracts here. So okay, here's the ocean token one that I used before. So I'll take contract number two here and just rename it. And we'll just call this faucet. Okay, go ahead and save that. And I'm just gonna delete everything in this sample contract right here. All right, so what we need to do in order to connect to a remote contract is we need to first of all, just grab all of the contract code and copy it into the file. So I'm just gonna control C all of this and where to go Yeah, back here and go ahead and paste that in. All right, so this, this code basically needs to match what's out there on the blockchain. All right, and so then we can go over to compile, make sure this is compiled. Make sure your compiler is set to the right version. And then once that's complete, all right, let's switch over to our deploy tab. And we wanna make sure that we've selected injected provider MetaMask so that we can control all the transactions with our MetaMask wallet. So that should open up MetaMask and prompt us to uh, go ahead and connect. Okay, so go ahead and accept that. And we're connected to Remix, great. All right, so Next thing we need to do is just grab the address of our uh, remote contract and go ahead and paste it in the at address field. So we'll grab that right there and make sure you, and go ahead and click on at address. And we should see our deployed account down at the bottom. So, or sorry, our deployed contract. So go ahead and expand that. And we can see all the methods and state variables from our contract. So we can start to uh, test some of these utility functions down here. So get balance, that should have an initial value of zero since we haven't preloaded our contract with anything yet. Perfect. And our lock time should be one minute or it might show as 60 seconds. So let's check that out, perfect. Our token, that should match the token address of our ERC20 token. That looks good, we can go ahead and verify by comparing with what we have in Notepad. That looks perfect. And then the withdrawal amount, that's gonna be 50 tokens. And there we go, 50 followed by 18 zeros. All right, so we can do some further testing here. We can test the uh, request tokens function and that should fail off the bat because um, remember we said that there's gotta be tokens in the contract <laughs> for anyone to request any tokens, so. Make sure you're connected to the to the right network. And yeah, there we go. So we, we get a message warning us that the transaction is likely gonna fail and we can even see our error message that we coded. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and grab the faucet address and the next step, what we need to do is actually send in some tokens to the contract that we can work with. So we'll pop open MetaMask and let's see, I'm gonna click on send, make sure you're, yeah, again, make sure you're on the right test network. Go ahead and paste in the faucet address and let's see, I should be able to switch to our ERC20 token over here. Oh, you know what? Um, what we need to do is actually import the token first because I forgot we'd done a previous deployment, but we redeployed today, so we need to go ahead and click on import tokens. Go ahead and grab the address of our ERC20 token. Yep, paste it in there. It's recognizing the ticker symbol and the decimal places. Go ahead and click on import tokens. There we can see 70 million OCT. And that's per the specification in our smart contract. So we can try our send one more time. Let's go back and grab the faucet address. Uh, there's a lot of copying and pasting of addresses in Web3. <laughs> Always fun. So we can now see our token there in the dropdown and select it. And let's go ahead and do 200. 
we'll send in 200 ERC20 tokens to give us something to work with. All right, and that transaction will take a few seconds to settle. All right, so now we can recheck the token balance on our contract and make sure that we've got 200 now. Great, that's a good sign. All right, so that's working. The next thing we can do is test our request token function. All right, see if we can drip from the faucet. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to account two for this test. And uh, when you do that, just make sure that you've imported the ERC20 token so that you can see, you know, probably a zero starting balance. But uh, in any case, just to make sure that you can uh, tell that it's been incremented after this, after this test. So it looks good. So let's go ahead and invoke request token. Uh oh, gas estimation error with the following message. See below the transaction execution will likely fail. Do you want to force sending? That's strange I, because I should have more than enough gas to handle a simple transfer transaction. That's weird. Let's go ahead and send this anyway and see what happens. All right, I'm going to go ahead and confirm it. And let's just monitor the output down here to see what happens. All right, and it did fail. So uh, what we can do is pop open the debugger to see if there's anything useful. Uh, so if I do start debugging, which it does that, um, I guess, automatically. So <laughs> basically this little toolbar represents all the steps in the operation, stepping through the code. And I could just use this like any other debugger. Uh, there are a couple of useful things I can look at here. This will give me the solidity state. In other words, all of my state variables so I can inspect them. Everything looks okay now. I mean, everything looks correct. Um, the step details will kind of tell you what's going on every step of the way. And then you can look at the global variables down there and you can see all the items on the stack and all the opcodes as well. So let's just take a quick look here. Okay. And we can see uh, memory being allocated over there down here in the stack. This is just some memory being allocated before a variable is actually assigned. Now it's populated but I'm not really seeing anything specific that alerts me to what's going on here, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm not seeing any red flags here. Everything is looking as I would expect it to. Yeah, it seems to be frozen up at this point and I'm not really getting much useful information out of here. So I think what I'm gonna have to do is go back to the code and just sort of look through things manually and see if I can spot any, um, any bugs, all right. Well, one thing I noticed is that I spelled withdraw wrong. <laughs> so I'm gonna quickly fix that. Um, that's not the cause of the error. That's um, because I, I misspelled it consistently. So, <laughs> but I'll take this opportunity to fix that. So I'll do a quick find and replace there just for good measure, all right. Um, and so since this is sort of failing, I mean, when I look at the request token, I don't see any problem with the require statements and I don't see any problem with the, um, sort of the time related variables. Uh, we're doing this token transfer. So that's a bit of a black box, but we've toasted, we've uh, <laughs> toasted, we've tested the token. So we know that code is solid. Um, so what does that leave basically in the picture, um, the interface? And so that's the first thing I'm gonna look at. And so, you know, I could import the interface and just automatically um, sort of make sure that all this code is, is correct. Or sort of take my, um, you know, human user error out of the picture really easily. But I'm just gonna take a quick look here. Let's see token, ERC20. All right, so here's the official interface. So since there are just a couple of methods, I should be able to like quickly check these. Let's see, transfer, that's a transfer event. Yeah, transfer. Um, And I saw something change right away that I had a view here. This is obviously not a view function because transfer um, causes a change to occur on the blockchain. Like we're, we're actually changing the token balances. So that's a, a right operation to the blockchain. So that actually could have been the error right there. Let's check balance of. Just 
to make sure I probably should have manually copied these in the first place. But here we are. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's the same. And um, event, that was at the top. All right, so with those changes, let's go ahead and redeploy our faucet contract. So I'm gonna go back up, press the up key to get back to this command and go ahead and um, run that. All right, our contract finished deploying. So again, I'm just gonna grab the address and save it in my notepad, replacing the old one. Okay, and let's go back out to remix. And so make some more space here. And basically we've got to just uh, delete all that code and copy and paste everything in again. Okay. Good. And I'm going to clear this logging out. All right, let's go back and make sure that, well, let's delete this old contract. Um, we'll make sure it's compiled and everything is good. In the meantime, I'm going to grab the address. Okay, copy that. And let's go down to our deployment tab and I'll just replace the old address with the new one. And we'll go ahead and redeploy. All right, so there's our new contract. Uh, since we've already tested this, we'll just do a very quick run through. Make sure things look okay. Lock time, yep, token. Okay, good, so far so good. So we'll just go ahead and send it some tokens right away. Come on, MetaMask. All right, and I'm just gonna do another send. Let's do the same thing. We'll stick with 200. Go ahead and sign that transaction and send it on over. All right, that's complete. So let's recheck the balance. There we go. There's our 200 coins. And let's go and switch back to account number two. All right, I'm gonna do request. All right, this time it's opening up. That's a very good sign. I can't believe it. See, the interface was the problem. So it's so important to make sure that all of the interface function signatures match what you're actually trying to interface with. All right, let's check our balance of account two. And there's our 50 OCT. Excellent, so that worked. All right, now I'm gonna quickly try another test within a minute here, and that should not be allowed to happen, right? Because of our time lock. So let's try again. Great, so we get an error, insuff insufficient time elapsed since, since last withdrawal, which is exactly what we wanna see. Great, all right. So we just really have to wait like 30 more seconds and try it again, and we should be allowed to do it after one minute. All right, so let's just pause for about a minute and we'll retry that. All right, let's try another token request. This time it's opening up again to ask me to sign the transaction, so it's gonna allow us to go ahead and make that request. So it looks like our time lock is working great. And I can go ahead and request new tokens. I'll immediately try another one. Let's just test this again. The only reason that allowed it to happen that time is because the time lock had not actually been saved to the blockchain. So if I do it again, it won't work. Yeah. And let's just see if we have 100 OCT now. Perfect. Okay, so that part seems to be working great. That's our main functionality, so that's important. Let's try to withdraw the funds. Let's try to withdraw all the funds with account two. We should not be able to do this. Execution reverted. The only, only the contract owner can call this function. Perfect. Great. All right, so um, let's uh, check a few things with the owner account just to make sure that we can use the setters and withdraw the funds. All right, so I'm gonna switch back to account number one. And let's go ahead and withdraw all the funds. 
This time it allows me to do that, so I'll go ahead and sign this transaction. Confirm. Now we can check the contract balance once this settles and it should be back down to zero. It'll take a minute for that to be reflected. Well, that, that reflects the last transaction, but not the most recent one. It's not instantaneous. So yep, there it's gone through now, so we can check it. That should be zero, great. And our wallet balance should have the remaining, I forget how much was left, like uh, I think it was 100 tokens or something like that. So yep, that's been incremented back up. All right, let's just try a few simple uh, set things. So we did one minute before. Let's try, you know, setting it to five minutes. Set lock time. I'll confirm that. And I'll try another transaction to set the withdrawal amount. So we started with 50. 50 tokens. Let's change it to a 25. Just something that's easy to see. All right, so let's check these. Let's check, um, what was the first one we did? Set withdrawal amount. That's this one right here. Uh, that one hasn't gone through yet. Let's check the lock time. 300 seconds, that's five minutes, perfect. And I didn't see if the second one is updated yet. Set withdrawal amount. And that's been updated to 25 tokens. Perfect, so at this point it looks like everything is working great with the faucet. We're able to test the um, request, request token function, the withdrawal function. We were able to test a lot of the conditions around those regarding permissions and um, only owner. We were able to get the balance of the contract. We were able to reset the lock time, reset the withdrawal amount. And that concludes the testing for this contract. All right, well, uh, I appreciate you guys checking out this video. I may follow this one up with a sort of a faucet dApp tutorial, short, uh, you know, Web3 kind of UI tutorial to tie this one up. Um, but other than that, yeah, appreciate it. If you guys uh, like this kind of content, you want to see more about um, blockchain and uh, DeFi, Web3 and all that kind of good stuff, uh, definitely encourage you to subscribe to the channel. And uh, until then, I will catch you next time. Take care, guys. Bye.